Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, to kick off this session. Um, my, I, th I see my job today uh, as um, introducing the theme of well-being and health. Um, and the presentation I'm giving today uh, is based on a literature review of, of scientific papers. Uh, on the one hand, looking at uh, the definition of health and well-being, and on the other hand, looking at how some of those definitions may have implications and opportunities for architecture and, and architectural research. Um, the focus is very much on domestic architecture and on Europe. The outline of my talk is, as I say, to define, firstly to define uh, very briefly uh, health and well-being, then to introduce uh, a fairly recent notion of five ways to well-being, which is a helpful technique for uh, addressing some of the key themes that relate to well-being. And then thirdly, look at how these uh, ideas impact on or have implications for uh, housing design. And I'll wrap up with some, some conclusions at the end. So the first um, step, and I won't actually mention daylight very much, I will, and, or, or views or contact with nature. That will be, in a way, the role of um, uh, people that follow me. Um, so. Um, I'm going to take a broader view, and the first one clearly is to, to, to look more closely at how we define health, and health is now not just defined in terms of physical health, but is to do as much with the mental, psychological, uh, and social uh, well-being. So there's a shift, there has been a shift for a while now, away from treating uh, physical illness uh, uh, to a wider understanding of, um, of the psychological and social uh, context. And in part, uh, one of the problems at the moment is that um, there's an enormous pressure on our hospitals uh, due to, I suppose, lifestyle-related uh, health problems, mental health uh, as well as uh, physical health, uh, including things like obesity and, and, and people's diets and fitness levels uh, and levels of exercise, but also an aging community where, where um, hospitals seem to be uh, and have been for too long the kind of first port of call, whereas actually we should be thinking much more about how we design built environments to prevent some of these um, challenges. So um, the, this approach are, uh, sees um, health and well-being as interdependent. I'm quoting now from a, a, an architectural and built environment report. It holds prevention as uh, important as cure and looks for long-term solutions rather than more immediately attainable treatments. Um, so there's a, a focus on, on a, a much broader set of um, indicators of, of health problems and, and uh, preventative measures. Uh, and and I, I think architecture and the built environment has a, a strong role to play in um, particularly social and uh, mental uh, well-being in, in the built environment. Um, health can be defined and has been defined by specialists. I'm an architect by training, so I'm certainly not a health specialist. Uh, in, two, in two ways. One is what's called the hedonic well-being, which is to do with happiness, pleasure attainment, uh, pain avoidance, and these tend to be relatively short-term uh, um, aspects of well-being and feeling good. And the other is functioning well, the eudaimonic uh, well-being, which is a longer term, uh, has longer-term implications to do with um, purposefulness in life, meaning, and self-realization. But um, The, um, there has been a lot of uh, research on defining and measuring well-being, and one of the key uh, people uh, that we've been working with in Cambridge is Felicia Huppert, um, whose paper is cited at the bottom there, um, uh, at the uh, Cambridge well Wellbeing Institute. And my Department of Architecture and Felicia's um, uh, Wellbeing Institute have been collaborating on identifying and quantifying some of these uh, parameters. And she has carried out a very large um, survey of, uh, as part of the European Social Survey of 43,000 people, um, looking at and validating um, measures of uh, well-being or, or f uh, factors in uh, well-being. And these are, effectively, she's established uh, 10, 10 uh, features uh, based on the opposite of internationally accepted degree symptoms for health disorder. So these are the, looking at the positive uh, side of, of health rather than ill health. And that's very much the, the tack I'm taking today. And she's uh, then taken uh, these, these surveys, used these surveys to establish, for example, that in terms of flourishing, which is at the very uh, uh, upper end of well-being, uh, that uh, Denmark is, has a population that is 40% flourishing, 
uh, compared to Russia, Portugal, and Poland, where it's near 10% flourishing. So there's a, there's a big uh, difference. The UK, the Netherlands, uh, Germany are around 20% flourishing. And the, and the purpose really is when we think of um, the spectrum of well-being. So on the, on the far left, we've got mental disorders uh, and, and ill health. And on the right uh, is flourishing. And this is the sort of typical Gaussian distribution that one might ex expect with respect to a, a population. Uh, the aim of, uh, uh, is to try and nudge um, this population uh, up so that more of them fall into the category of flourishing. And that nudge, and we've heard about nudge architecture and, uh, from, from a, um, a famous book in 2008 by Taylor and, and Sustain on uh, improving decisions about health, wealth, and happiness. Uh, it was very influential, both in, particularly in the UK, and the government set up a nudge, what we call the Nudge Institute. It's now been privatized. Um, it's all about identifying where the opportunities are in nudging people or offering people the opportunities to improve their uh, lot and to improve their, improve their well-being. Uh, and a small shift in that Gaussian distribution and in that distribution of population gives you quite a significant advantage in when you look at the whole population, as opposed to worrying about individuals, uh, an increase in, in the people who are, uh, uh, see themselves as flourishing. Uh, and, and I think that the fact that it's a small difference is important because I think it's very difficult to um, be precise about architecture's contribution to uh, well-being, but anything that can give us a bit of extra leverage and push us in the right direction has the potential to have a, a significant overall effect. Now, um, rather than taking Felicia Huppert's um, 10 uh, sort of subjective uh, descriptions of, uh, and questions about people's sense of well-being, um, I've picked up on, and Felicia has contributed to, um, the, uh, the government's report on well-being, uh, which provides a critical mass of evidence that led to the definition of the five ways to well-being. And these are more practical, more objective uh, set of characteristics that... I, I feel we can more easily use and apply to the built environment. So uh, the second part of my talk, I will just briefly describe these five ways. These are uh, listed here. Connect, keep active, take notice, keep learning, and give. These are very abbreviated terms and, and, and um, anchors, I suppose, for a, a more complex set of definitions. Uh, and these have been associated with positive mental health and have shown to be... Uh, influenced by physical design characteristics. And you'll see at the bottom of where I, ha uh, where I make references uh, to scientific papers, these are the, the, the sources of information that, that uh, support um, my uh, summary. Um, and by the way, if you can't read those, um, uh, or if you, you can't take note of all those um, references, they're in the uh, Daylight and Architecture Journal uh, in which the, the, the underlying paper was um, published in uh, this year. So if I go through each one very briefly, just describing them, well, connecting is about the quantity and quality of social connections, talking and listening to families or family members or strangers even. This correlates, this connection and these, these social connections uh, correlates with reported well-being as well as physical health. This is sort of, again, here are three papers that, uh, from which this, uh, where we find this evidence uh, for these correlations. Um, Keeping active, I think this is a much more generally well understood idea. There's plenty of evidence from global um, meta studies to demonstrate that physical activity reduces symptoms of mental and physical uh, ill health. Um, taking notice, being mindful, mindfulness is a, is a, is a, a term that's now coined uh, increasingly frequently, also in business uh, context. Paying attention to the present, being aware of things, of thoughts and feelings is also a behavior that uh, reduces symptoms of stress, anxiety, and depression. Fourthly, keep learning. Aspirations are shaped, typically shaped in early life, and such aspirations are modified by the environment. Um, later in life, there's evidence uh, to show that those participating, for example, in music, art, or evening classes, achieve higher subjective well-being. And then finally, give, or uh, altruism. Um, here we're talking about creating settings for pro-social rather than self-centered behavior. And this has, a, again, a, a positive impact. Uh, opportunities for people to support each other in mixed communities, etc., has impact on happiness. And such behaviors are related both to spending time and money on others, 
as opposed to oneself. There isn't much evidence to support that spending money on yourself gives you much long-term sense of well-being. Um, and through volunteering and offering help. Now, these are the sort of basic um, uh, brief descriptions of these uh, characteristics. And, I suppose, and, and my, the third part of my talk is really just to very briefly review what the implications may be for design, using some further evidence from building environment researchers uh, to, um, to pin down these, um, what these uh, five ways mean for, for urban and building design in, in, in housing. So I'm starting again with Connect and going through these, these five points. Um, at an urban design level, um, clearly creating provision for everyday public spaces creates opportunities for people to connect. Um, often we design bits of cities in terms of transport routes and as opposed to places and spaces for people to, to, to um, interact and, and to stop. Um, so some of the um, key qualities include location, a location that's accessible with proximity to communal resources, uh, to support casual encounters, places to stop and sit in, on a park bench or in a cafe table uh, to facilitate encounters, however brief. Um, adaptabilities, that, that means spaces that are um, without prescribed functions, um, which enable spontaneous and impromptu activities to occur, so sort of non-specific design. Uh, homeliness, a sense of safety and familiarity is important for uh, encouraging people to go out and interact. Uh, pleasantness, these are rather vague terms, I, I realize, uh, but these come out of, of the research and of the, of the social studies. Um, pleasantness, clean, uh, peaceful spaces, or on, on, in contrast, bustling and lively spaces. Uh, specialness, spaces that have, or places that have unique qualities, unique aesthetics, and perhaps reinforce memories of going to those kinds of places, whether they be woodlands or climbing up trees. Um, other um, aspects of connect, and, and, and this is, I have to say at the urban level, the, the well-being research is much more established than at the level of an individual house, but I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, at an urban level, we know that pedestrian-oriented as opposed to car-oriented uh, areas it correlates with a sense of community and ability to interact and to stop. Um, and pedestrian environments are particularly strongly related to opportunities for social interaction. Um, but also, and as we'll hear in a moment from uh, my, my ex-supervisor, Nick, ba Nick Baker, um, we, we know that connections with an, an access to natural green landscape uh, qualities and spaces has widely and for a long time now been, or for a while, been associated with a range of, um, of health benefits. The other, finally, uh, other uh, connect aspect, well, this is a broader general uh, term, a quote from uh, some research showing that um, public spaces that bring people together, where friendships and support networks are made and maintained were key to a uh, general sense of well-being. And when we come to the interior, the, the, the in internal design of a house, we have opportunities, for example, to, to connect in different ways. Um, through the way we prepare food, perhaps together, perhaps as part of a more theatrical um, uh, engagement, uh, a performance almost, and that has implications for the way we might design our, our uh, food preparation areas, our kitchens. Uh, on the right, uh, as I say, other people will talk much more about links with nature and, and access to light as in training, helping to entrain circadian rhythms. Um, but clearly, an, a contact with the outside and, and an understanding and awareness of the conditions and uh, uh, the weather conditions is, is part of how we connect and creating those opportunities and the diversities of those opportunities in terms of orientation is important. And also con just connecting with each other, people finding places to have a conversation or to sit and, uh, and, and talk. Uh, and, uh, and, and having a variety of those kinds of conditions where it could be just a one-to-one -one conversation or a you know, family uh, discussion around a, a, a dining table, for example. On the key active side, well, there are um, many design characteristics associated with uh, inc increasing activity, physical activity, and these are to do with access to sports uh, centers and, and equipment, um, access to pedestrian access and cycle access to work, to shops, to school, supporting the idea of mixed mode, high density development. Uh, residential high density again allows more, uh, a greater proximity of different kinds of uh, um, um, destinations and opportunities for, for, for people. Um, mixed use, high density mixed use, again is part of that same 
argument, and then finally walkability, making it convenient and safe, uh, and introducing traffic calming measures. These are, again, at an urban level, a, a fairly well understood uh, principles. Um, physical activity outdoors is clearly important, and the, ben the extra benefit you have of being outdoors in terms of light and fresh air, uh, and in contact potentially with nature is important, but also physical activity inside is important. And so uh, design strategies could be uh, employed to promote uh, indoor physical activities, such as uh, creating exercise spaces, um, encouraging stair use, and here's an example of a, an, a, fun, a fun stair use where you can imagine lots of energy being spent running up, and down, running up the stairs and sliding down again. Um, but also creating act attractive experiences, making the movement and circulation around the building enjoyable through uh, light and artwork and um, views out and greenery. Um, Three-story homes may be better for us. There is something called, well, my GP referred to as the uh, bungalow knee effect. So old pe old, as people get older, they tend to go into bungalows. And because they don't have stairs to exercise th themselves, they get knee joint problems. Um, so in some respects, it's better to stay in a three-story house for as long as you can to avoid, avoid those mobility uh, problems, if you can. Um, and here's some research by uh, Baker and others um, referring to the, the kind of the value, the, the, the proportion of uh, energy that's spent with, uh, with moving up and down stairs. And that might have implications for how you organize your, your house. So you wouldn't necessarily have a... Uh, a living room on the same floor as a dining room so you, or, or a study on the same floor as a bedroom. You might actually try and encourage people to move up and down the house and time is running out. Right, let me see if I can find a quick shortcut. Um, I think I'll probably just skip through these. As I say, the article is in the, in the journal um, and uh, these are just some more observations with uh, references to show uh, um, what uh, the implications might be for design. Um, so to conclude, um, we, I've defined health and well-being very, very briefly and identified these five ways to well-being as a useful tool to uh, relate to architecture. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, the anticipated effect, there has been some research uh, that suggests that the anticipated effect of the built environment is in the order of 10%. I suspect it could be larger because the way we, we live and we, we uh, uh, relate to each other is determined by our built environment uh, right from birth. Um, so the focus has been very much on making sure that the physical parameters, which we will, we, we will probably discuss today in greater depth, are good enough, but not to, ensure, not to make those, those uh, quantitative parameters too uh, um, narrowly uh, uh, too deterministic it, it, with respect to all the other opportunities that might exist. To nudge positive behaviours, for example, putting a bike shed near the front door of the house rather than in the back garden like it is in my house means that you can get out on your bike much more quickly than getting in your car and driving somewhere. Um, and, uh, and designing places and spaces to interact with each other, and that's really the last slide um, that um, the way we design our, uh, these moments of interactions and these moments of uh, uh, behavioral opportunities are, are what makes, in my view, makes good architecture. And it's um, where there are more of these moments, more of these opportunities to uh, uh, use your building in, in, a, in a way that's uh, helpful and supportive of your lifestyle and your, or your health needs um, is a better architecture. And just to quote um, uh, David King at the end here, design-led interventions can make better choices easier. In a way, that's fundamental and uh, uh, underpins the uh, idea of, um, of this review. Thank you very much.